is South Africa. No, really, I promise this time it, it really is. Yeah, oops. Sorry about that one, guys. Anyway, South Africa is an economy that is really important to understand as a kind of potential outcome case study of an inequality system gone bad. The nation itself, on paper at least, is not so terrible. It is actually one of the wealthiest nations in all of Africa, trading back and forth quite frequently with Nigeria. It is also an economy made up primarily of services as opposed to manufacturing or agriculture, which is normally the sign of a very developed economy. To top this all off, the nation is blessed with an abundance of natural resources, particularly extremely high value commodities like platinum, gold, and diamond, which are very easily traded amongst its balanced portfolio of trade partners. What is more is that it is not overly dependent on any of these natural resources to prop up its economy. Sure, they help, but the nation still has other industries that employ more people and produce more wealth for the nation overall. On top of this, South Africa's Human Development Index is actually quite good. The Human Development Index is a nominal figure made up of using key quality of life indicators like access to education, infant mortality, life expectancy, all of that fun stuff, and then throwing it into a formula to give you a number between 0 and 1. South Africa has a Human Development Index figure of 0.705, which is pretty damn good for an African nation and puts it ahead of all other major countries on the continent. So, all being said, if you just look down the right hand side of a Wikipedia article on the economy of South Africa, you will be forgiven for thinking that it is a pretty average global nation. Certainly far from Western nations like North America or Europe, but still well ahead of other African nations. But this all starts to fall apart when you look at this little figure here. We have explored the Gini coefficient on the channel before, but a brief rundown is that it is a number between 0 and 1 that nominally signifies how equal a country is. A 0 means perfect equality, and a 1 means one person owns everything, with nothing else left for anybody. On top of this, it is important to remember that there are normally two Gini figures that economists will look at. The first is income genie figures, which measures the breakdown of how equally income is distributed, and wealth genie figures, which measures how net worth is spread amongst individuals in a society. The figure most commonly stated is income genie figures, and for reference, the income genie coefficient of the United States is 0.39, a country that is typically seen as more even with a stronger social policy system like, say, Finland, has an income genie coefficient of 0.26 and a more ruthless cutthroat capitalistic market like the People's Republic of China has an income Gini coefficient figure of 0.47. So you can see it is pretty evenly spread amongst most major economies in the world. Now, South Africa? Well, South Africa has an income Gini coefficient figure of 0.63, making it by far and away the most un- even nation on earth. This by extension also means that a lot of the nice things we saw about the nation earlier, the strong human development index, the strong service sector, the lack of reliance on a single industry or trade partner, well, all of that only really goes to a select group of very wealthy individuals in this society. Now, inequality isn't necessarily a bad thing. Most economists, myself included, see inequality as a really powerful tool to incentivize individual participants in an economy to improve their skills, seek out more productive professions, or simply work harder to increase their own living standards. A convenient byproduct of more skilled or more efficient or harder working participants in an economy is that more output is produced, which means more goods and services, which means higher living standards for everyone. This is the extremely oversimplified foundation of any capitalist economy. You do well for yourself by doing good for others. Not many people have a problem with this for the most part. Most rational economists, policymakers, and citizens agree that hard work should be rewarded, and those that don't want to be as productive will not reap the same rewards. But where this all gets a bit murky is when we look at the extremes on both ends of the scale. In the case of South Africa, the extreme end that we will be looking at is this one, the poor end, where a large part of the nation lives in poverty. But 
Something that probably has been more widely scrutinised in recent decades is inequality on the other end of the spectrum, with huge concentrations of wealth in the hands of a very, very select few. Now, both of these extremities would lead to inequality on the Gini calculation, but one is measurably worse than the other. Inequality in the sense of billionaires becoming increasingly wealthy is the type of inequality that most people get angry about in first world countries and it is easy to see why. The wealth of global billionaires has skyrocketed in recent times, while salaries and benefits for regular workers in countries like the United States has remained more or less stagnant. A common criticism of this is that sure, net living standards have improved, but these improvements aren't going to everyday people, it is going to billionaires that can now afford four private jets as opposed to the one that they could afford 10 years ago. This kind of inequality does cause social issues, and also quite a bit of contempt where wealth is in turn used to influence policies to further the advantages that wealthy individuals have over their peers. But for the most part, extreme concentrations of wealth don't really hinder net living standards. Macroeconomists are a bit of a cold-hearted bunch. We don't really have time to assess the feelings of each individual participant in a society to make sure that they are satisfied with their allocation of goods and services. For the most part, macroeconomists are pretty focused on growth. Growth measured by the change in gross domestic product, which is more or less a function of how many people are out there buying and investing in things. GDP figures don't really discriminate between a billionaire buying their second mega yacht or 200 families buying their first home. It is all the same to a GDP calculation. Now this model has limitations in and upon itself. That will be explored in a video all by itself. But all other things being equal, huge concentrations of wealth doesn't mean anything so long as money is changing hands. This is all great for an economy like the United States, but this isn't necessarily the problem in South Africa. South Africa is only home to six billionaires, and one of those is Elon Musk, who probably wouldn't really call South Africa home anymore. What South Africa does have though, is a small group consisting of about 2% of the population that live similar to upper middle class American, which lies in stark contrast to the rest of the population which live similar lives to their peers in neighboring African nations. The big and obvious reason for this is the hangover the nation has had with strong social policies that dictated that there were two distinct classes of citizen in the nation. The cycle of poverty is very hard to break. The biggest determinant factor of if someone will be wealthy today is if they were born wealthy. It is something that sounds so obvious that you would probably roll your eyes at someone pointing it out. But in nations built on the idea that anybody can end up anywhere depending on how much effort they put in, it does sound like a factoid that shouldn't really be true. The issue is that wealth begets wealth and poverty, especially absolute poverty, begets poverty. As of 2018, more than half of the nation of South Africa is living on less than $5.50 a day, which is the World Bank's threshold for absolute poverty. What makes this concerning is that this is one of the few countries where this figure is on the rise. The growth of economies like China and India have been largely responsible for pulling billions of people out of absolute poverty worldwide. Increasing technologies that are shared throughout the globe that is becoming increasingly interconnected has been a huge force for good for most nations to raise the living standards for their average citizens. People would be forgiven for thinking that for the most part, all countries are improving everywhere. Sure, some are slower than others, but improving nonetheless. But that simply isn't true. South Africa is going backwards, and here's why. The first cause is one of the negative side effects of inequality. If you have inequality to the point that it is pushing a large portion of your population into relative, or even worse, pushing parts of your population into absolute poverty, you will find that your workforce becomes less productive. People won't have the same access to education, so they won't be able to move into more technical profession. They won't have access to decent nutrition or healthcare to make sure that they are working at their potential in any roles that they do go into. And 
they also won't see any kind of social mobility that would encourage them to work a little bit harder for a shot of improving their quality of life. When inequality raises individuals up miles above everyone else, it causes social issues. When inequality pushes everyone down below a select group, it causes economic issues. Another major issue is of course the inherent instability in the nation caused by this inequality. Now, without sounding like a broken record, regular channel viewers will of course know that stability is the foundation of any good economy, and South Africa has been for the most part very unstable in recent decades. Large political changes that have dictated the modern history of South Africa have been very unsettling to the powers that be within the nation. Now things like the ending of apartheid and the election of Nelson Mandela were of course huge social victories for the nation, but it did give rise to something known as capital flight. The mostly rich, mostly white individuals that made up the residency of gated communities feared the rise in crime and civil unrest that a lot of these policies have caused. Today, South Africa is home to a lot of wealthy people, but their lifestyle is somewhat limited. They live in gated communities with armed guards and genuinely have to take precautions about where they go out of fear of being kidnapped or robbed or carjacked. Crime in South Africa, particularly around population centers like Johannesburg, is very high. And while any kind of violent crime is inexcusable, a lot of this is caused by the close proximity of millionaires with people that are struggling to feed themselves. Oftentimes, criminal acts are the most lucrative form of employment available to the citizens of the nation. This furthers the mental divide that has existed in the country since colonialism, but it also more specifically encourages rich people to leave the nation. Why live in a fortress fearing for your life when you could just leave and start fresh in a fully developed western nation? Oh, and of course, while you are at it, you are going to take your money with you. Sell your house and your car, maybe sell your business, load up all the cash and transferable assets you can, and ship them overseas to your new home. This is called capital flight, and this is a major cause for concern, particularly in South Africa. When that house or car or business is sold, the values of these non-movable assets drop. When South African Rand is sold for American dollars, this drops the value of South Africa's currency. And when material and non-material assets are transferred out of the country, the country is that much poorer for it. South Africa is a nation similar to many nations we have explored before on the channel. Limitless potential with good geography, an abundance of natural resources, and a young population but as with many of them, it seems to have missed the mark in executing on these advantages to materially improve the lives of its citizens. Although, in South Africa's case, that probably isn't entirely fair. It does improve the lives of its citizens, it's just that it's only a handful of citizens, which causes just as many issues as squandering the wealth entirely. Wealth builds wealth and poverty builds poverty. South Africa has the problem where it is building both. It is hard to see potential solutions for South Africa's problems beyond band-aid fixes like limiting capital exiting the country that acts more as to slow the bleeding rather than healing the wound. So much has been said about inequality in recent years that is more often particularly targeted at extremely wealthy individuals in contrast to average citizens of developed countries. But perhaps South Africa should be more of a case study to argue over. A case study that exists now and is causing issues now a case study not of extreme rich versus average first world citizens, but a case study of first world citizens versus everyone else. Hi guys and thanks for watching the latest video. A huge thank you to our new patrons over on Patreon. Your support continues to make this channel possible. As always, we will be live streaming the Q&A session held on our Discord server. So come on over and join us there or hop onto the YouTube live stream for the second channel linked in the video description if you want to participate in that. Otherwise, if you did enjoy, please consider liking and subscribing. Thanks guys. Bye.